Thank you. So um, what I'll be saying will be um, to quite a large extent based upon the work of other people. Uh, in particular, the um, sort of technical underpinning for the part of the talk which will be new, hey, not, not overlapping with talks I've given other, over recent years, will come from the work of uh, Thomas Walpuski in his PhD thesis. And um, just to avoid disappointment, let me say that we're not going to reach any decisive conclusion at the end of the talk with any kind of big result. This, is, this really will be a kind of account of um, work in progress um, towards goals which uh, well, we'd like to reach both in the, in the short, medium, and longer term, as, as I'll try to explain. So let, let me begin uh, section one with a, a kind of a beast review of uh, things about uh, G2 manifolds. But I'll stay with the standard. <clears throat> Supposing we have a, a seven dimensional vector space, real vector space and a three-form on it, then we could consider the quadratic form, or the quadratic forms with values in a, in a line, given by taking a vector v and uh, mapping this to the contraction of v with phi to give a two-form, squared to give a four-form, wedge phi. So this, this ends up in the top exterior power, which is one-dimensional. So it, 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 it makes sense to say that this, this, uh, this, this form is definite. If we, we choose a basis element, a volume form, then we can think of this as a real valued form. And in that case, we say phi is a positive form. <coughs> definite. And the basic fact is that these positive forms form a single orbit under the action of the general linear group, so they're all, in that sense, equivalent. And um, the stabilizer, if we take any one, the stabilizer under this action is um, contained in the orthogonal group because it preserves this form, and also there's a preferred orientation, so it's, 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 it's contained in the special orthogonal, orthogonal group. And the, the sta this stabilizer is the exceptional group G2 in SO7. <clears throat> and uh, the, the reason these are, this exceptional group is particularly interesting in differential geometry, of course, is it's one of the exceptional groups on Berger's list, which can appear in, as holonomy groups of Riemannian manifolds. So a, a basic model for, one of, for such a, a positive form at so the algebraic level, if we take um, C3, there is some R, so we take complex coordinates Z1, Z2, Z3 here, and a real coordinate T here, then <coughs> if we think of this C3 having the structure group SU3, so it has a, a Hermitian form, with the form omega, and also a, a holomorphic volume form, then a, a, kind of a model for such a positive three form would be to take the real part of the holomorphic volume form plus omega wedge dt. So we want, to, we want to now to move on to a seven-dimensional manifold uh, and consider one which is a Riemannian manifold with holonomy G2.
And uh, this, 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 this structure can be defined in various ways. One would be in terms of having a parallel spinner, but in terms of forms, uh, we can say it's given by having a, a form phi, which algebraically is positive at each point, uh, as considered above, and uh, therefore defines a, a metric by this uh, procedure. So we, have a, we also have a Hodge star phi, where the star is sort of uh, determined by this metric phi. And um, so the, the, the condition of having holonomy G2 is equivalent to having uh, such a form phi, which is closed, and also that the star is closed, so d phi. So we're interested in, in studying these kind of structures on, on seven-dimensional manifolds. What kind of uh, techniques do we have for, for doing that? Uh, in, in one direction, one has some kind of partial convergence theory results, th results about if we have a, a sequence of uh, such Riemannian manifolds with holonomy G2 under some additional conditions, and they have some kind of limit with various properties. So we have some convergence results. Due to, uh, due to Chiger and Tian. Uh, in the other direction, the, the, about the only technique in the, uh, the game, really, at the moment, are sort of gluing techniques. It's to say, constructing such manifolds by taking some simpler things that we understand better and gluing them together in the sense that you construct an approximate solution to this problem and then deform to an exact solution using an implicit function theorem. And there are two... Um, there, there are two, two main well, examples of this. One, one set of constructions due to uh, Dominic Joyce, which we start with, a, in the simplest case, a, 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 a flat manifold, seven-dimensional torus, divide by the action of the group to get a, a singular space, and then um, deform away the singularities, resolve the singularities. Uh, another construction, going back to Kovalev, where you take a pair of, say, W1 and W2 non compact Calabi Yau manifolds of dimension, real dimension six. So that in terms of holonomy, they have holonomy SU3. Uh, and then take the product, with, the product of these with circles. Now this, this model essentially shows that if we, the SU3 acting on six dimensions lies inside G2 when we add on a net trivial factor. So we take W1 times S1 and W2 times S1. These are seven-dimensional manifolds, which have got holonomy contained in G2. And then, uh, in super situations, Kolev glues these together to construct a, um, a manifold with genuine holonomy G2. So from one point of view, I mean, there, there are many. So from a theoretical point of view, we can say we know we have some moduli space of um, of uh, these G2 structures on a given manifold up to diffeomorphisms isotopic identity. 
And uh, there's known that this is a, this is a map from, if we just take the cohomology class of, um, of phi, then this gives a, a local homeomorphism with a neighborhood in the moduli space with a neighborhood in H3. <coughs> So, um, but that, that's more or less all that's known about in, in equal generality. So, a way you could think of these kind of gluing results is that you have some potentially huge, more or less unexplored moduli space at the moment, and these kind of gluing results are giving some kind of description of small neighborhoods of degenerate limits inside such a, modu such a, such a moduli space. Uh, yeah, it has to be non-trivial by um, by a simple. Um, if you work out the L two normal of the curvature tensor or something, then you get something. So, so the typical thing is that one has some examples where we know we understand these sort of these small p parts of the moduli space, but what happens in the middle is a complete mystery. So what I want to talk about is not so much the, um, the, the, the theory of these uh, manifolds themselves, but studying geometry on such a manifold. And uh, the, the, um, the geometry I'm considering is primarily gauge theory, Yang-Mills theory, or theory of connections, and um, as we'll see, bound up with that, uh, the discussion of submanifolds, submanifold geometry. So let's um, just review the, the basic formal setup here. If we consider the space of connections on some bundle over a, a G2 manifold, then we can define a functional, well, so, <coughs> it's, well it's really a, locally a functional in the, in the space of connections by specifying that the variation of the functional is given by taking the uh, trace of the curvature, which the variation of the connection. So this thing gives us a three form. So we wedge with the star phi. So more precisely, this is really defining a one form on the space of connections, which locally, at least, we can integrate to define a functional. And uh, the fact that this is well-defined, gauge invariant, comes from the fact that this form is closed. We could do this in any situation, provided we had a, um, a, 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 a form of a, a n-dimensional manifold. If we have a, a closed form, an n minus uh, three form, we can write down such a formula. So in, in slightly more shorthand, you could write this as the integral of the churn simons invariant of A, which is star phi. Possibly speaking. <laughs> so the, the critical points of this functional, uh, just by Find by setting this variation to, to zero for all variations of the connection, those are just given by connections with f a wedge star phi equal to zero. So these are these are the, um, the primary objects we want to study. Yeah, it's, it's 
such special connections. This is a, this is a special form of the uh, Yang-Mills equations, much like the um, instanton equation on a four-manifold. Um, but these things can also be thought of as analogous to flat connections on three manifolds. If we, if we didn't have this form, and we're just using this ordinary churn simons invariant, then we'd be talking about the critical points being. So we can think of these analogous to, to flat connections over three manifolds. But we said at this, at this level, we're not really, all we're really using is this form is closed to write down this equation. What is, what is, um, what is uh, special, particular to this situation? The particular thing is that this is an elliptic equation when you interpret it modulo gauge, uh, or more precisely, the, 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 the local theory of such things is governed by an elliptic complex where we take bundle valued functions, which correspond to infinitesimal gauge transformations mapping to one forms, but then we map to six forms where we take, we take, um, we take the wedge product with star phi. So here we take d six forms, and then we take da goes to omega seven. So just as the local study of uh, around a flat connection on a three manifold is uh, can be formulated in terms of the bundle value Durham complex, this is the analogous thing. And the crucial thing is that this is an e e elliptic complex, so that's very special to this situation. <coughs> the, the, the other important thing is, this, say, analogous to the instanton equation on four manifolds is that you have a, for such a connection, you have a topological formula for the Yang-Mills energy is equal to the sum constant times you can write it this way, and this is a topological invariant. Of the, of the bundle we're considering. And this here is the fact that d phi is equal to zero. It's the, the fact that this thing is a, that phi represents a cohomology class, so this is really a, a formula in cohomology. So we're using both the, the sort of properties of our forms appearing in a rather crucial way in this, in this uh, theory. Yeah, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, essentially this is the only case. Apart, it's more or less the same as the fact there are only two cross products: the standard one on R three, and the Cayley product in R seven. It's the only time you get elliptic complexes. <coughs> so this is the basic uh, geometry we want to study: connections on seven manifolds, where you have much of the formal structure you would have for studying connections on, on three manifolds, but you bring in the, this form <coughs> phi. There's an analogous, let's consider sub-manifolds. So we're going to consider three-dimensional sub-manifolds inside our seven-manifold. And again, let, let's supposing we have some reference Submanifold P0, and we're working with ones which are in the same homology class, in fact, then we can define a functional, a many valued functional, in the same way that f of p is given by the integral over, should we call it, say, q of um, the same thing, star phi, where we choose a q is going to be a, a four chain with boundary p minus p naught. Of course, this is not really completely well-defined because we could vary Q in the relative homology class. 
So we would vary this thing by the periods of this wall form. But locally, it's a well-defined functional, just like the one we were considering before. And the critical points are what are called associative submanifolds. Uh, because you can, so the, the defining condition for this, you could just be to say that if I take any vector at a point, take any vector, contract it with star phi, and restrict to p, this is equal to zero for all v. And that's just, this is just a, a way of defining algebraically the condition on the tangent space of p at each point to be what's called an associative submanifold. You can see it's what immediately comes essentially out of writing down the variational formula. Yeah. In any case, these, this associative equation has analogous uh, good properties to these ones. It's an elliptic equation, and there's a, a topological bound on the area of such an associative submanifold. It's an example of Harvey and Lawson's calibrated geometry. So we've said, we've said that these, these connections are analogous in some ways to instantons in four dimensions, and ways analogous to flat connections in, in three dimensions. But what one has really, to be, to be slightly more general for a few, few moments, is really a kind of a six plus one plus one dimensional situation. We can either think about seven dimensions as being one less than eight or as one more than six. So very roughly speaking, the, um, the, the picture you might most optimistically hope for in this situation, where the, the, the eight-dimensional thing involves the special orthogonality group spin seven. This, in seven dimensions, we have this homotomy group G2. And in six dimensions, we have Calabi-Yau manifolds, homotomy group SU3. The kind of most optimistic kind of thing you might expect, just from the formal properties of the situation, is that by studying some similar kinds of equations on spin seven manifolds, you have certain numerical invariants. On a G2 manifold, you should expect, or oh, might hope, that you have some numerical invariants, but more subtly, some sort of vector space, kind of flow homology type invariants, in which these arise as the Euler characteristic of those. And in down here, you might optimistically hope that you have numerical invariants, floor type vector space invariants, and some kind of category, as a more, more uh, something like the Foucault category, more, more refined structure. So, um, let's say, oh, this is what, what you might most optimistically hope for. The only, the only Part of this, which is de definitely known, arises sort of in the simplest bit here. The numerical invariants defined by bundles over calabi yau manifolds. These are the, um, the, the holomorphic Casson invariants defined by Richard Thomas, also called DT invariants sometimes. Uh, maybe these things will have something to do with Dominic Joyce is going to talk about uh, in, in a, later today. What we're going up to, to discuss here is discussing the simplest possible structure in seven dimensions, this kind of analog of the Cassin invariant given by counting the uh, flat connections. So this, roughly speaking, this is the only thing that's known. This is here. So we'll see that th there's already quite enough difficulties in doing that just before worrying about <laughs> any other this fantasy picture. So the basic question we want to, um, the context we want to discuss is that can one 
to find some numerical invariant of a G2 manifold and, and a bundle over it by counting the solutions of this, um, this special equation, analogous to the Kasson invariant, counting the flat connections over a three manifold. So the main, the main point of the talk say, is to describe progress in that direction. But I say this could be this could be either positive progress or negative progress. It could be progress towards possibly ultimately doing that, or it could be progress towards showing that, in fact, you can't do that. But um, this is what we're... So it's really progress in understanding the, the problem. Can we count? So this this is this is called sometimes the G two instanton equation. Let's go say G two instantons. So in an analogous way, to which the Kasson invariant counts the flat connections or the three manifold. Well, I get to come. Uh, well, yes, because it's a, it arises at a critical point. Therefore, it always will be. Yeah. So, from the just from the structure, the basic structure that is things arise from this locally defined functional, we will have such things. Um, let's see. Right. So, I, so I, I want to. I'm, I'm hoping at the end of the talk to kind of try to explain what the best understanding what this problem really comes down to. So I'll, I'll try to push ahead a bit in order to get to that point, if possible. So but the first thing we might say, so far this is just a, a kind of a formal situation. We're just writing down definitions. You might first ask, do, we, do these things actually exist? Or, I mean, do, do we know any examples of these things, let alone trying to have a theory of counting them? Um, and. Um, I want to press on a bit. I won't go into this as much as I'd like. But, but we do, both through work of um, Thomas Walpuski and earlier of Henrique Serb, in both the situations where well, this, we know that we, we have these ways of constructing the manifolds, in a similar way, there are ways of constructing solutions to this equation, at least in favorable cases, by, again, gluing together simpler building blocks that we understand better. For example, in this picture here, we would take um, things coming from holomorphic bundles over these kalabi yau manifolds, which we know have got emission yang mills connections, which, and, then, and then have some theory to sh discuss constructing these G2 instantons. In this situation here, studied by Wolpuski, the basic um, ingredient, or one basic ingredient, would come from a flat connection over this orbifold. So one of the things one needs to study are representations of that orbifold fundamental group. So there's a lot of interest, I mean, these examples of a lot of interest in the geometry of these just by themselves. And also within the examples, you do see that there is a kind of at least a, a local counting. You see what we'd... We've, we've dropped a picture. See, going back to the picture we had, this big mysterious modulo space, so roughly speaking, the... If we stay inside such a region, then more or less we, un we un understand the counting problem. Uh, what we'd really like to do, though, is to have some kind of count which is deformation invariant, and so we can pass. We know that if we count here or we count there, we ought to get the same answer. But let's, let's press on and not say anything more about such examples. So there are various, more or less, some. Um, Perfectly well understood things that one has to do. One has problems from reducible connections, for example. One needs to imagine or, or prove that you have a suitable family of D 
deformations to retrieve transversality and so forth. But let's, let's not go into that. The, the overriding problem is the com compactness problem. We want to know if we have, um, if we have a sequence of such solutions, maybe with respect to a sequence of uh, G2 structures, then we want to understand sufficiently well the, that we can take a limit of that. So there is, there is um, just as we said about the manifolds themselves, there is some sort of partial theory due to Tian, but um, it, it, it falls far short of what one would need to really give a complete um, treatment at the moment. <coughs> so, but on the other hand, we can, the, the plus we will take, is to, in this, in this compactness discussion, there are certain difficulties that we more or less know are going to occur, so let's just imagine that nothing worse is going to happen than the things that we, we know are going to occur for the, for the purposes of this discussion. But before getting to that, let's talk about a much more elementary thing, which is the orientation problem. So this is something which is, already occurs in the standard kind of Cass and Fleur type situation, although it may, it may be made very explicit there. To say, we have, we have, a, we have some infinite dimensional manifold and we have some points which are critical points of a function or locally defined functional. And we want to, um, if we're in fine dimensions, we would say that we want to count these according to the index of the function. So the, the dimension was minus one to the index. The index is the dimension of the negative subspace. But of course, that is not well defined because immediately because that negative subspace is infinite dimensional. So we need to have a theory for regularizing that definition. And um, there is such a theory given by the notion of spectral flow. Supposing we, we up, up to a, supposing we imagine that we've legislated that this one has got uh, even index, so they can be counted with multiplicity plus one. If we take any other critical point, what we can do is we take a path um, between them, and then we count we take the spectral flow along this path. That's to say we count the number of times that the, the Hessian operator of our functional occur, uh, acquires a, minor, um, a zero eigenvalue. So we expect a finite set of times here where we, our Hessian gets a zero eigenvalue. We, the, 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 we, can, we count these with a relative sign given by minus one to that number. But the problem is that supposing we took a different path, if, you, if we took a path and varied it inside its homotopy class, then we'd get the same answer. But supposing we took a different path, then we might get some quite different spectral flow, modulo 2. Or another way of saying, if we take a loop, composing the paths, then we might get a if our spectral flow around a loop is um, some odd number, then that's saying that we don't have a consistent way of introducing orientations in our theory. So we, we really couldn't, that's the basic topological obstruction to doing this counting. So we want spectral flow modulo 2 to be zero around loops. So one positive thing in this theory is that we can, one can prove that this, in fact, is true in this situation. So taking a loop of connections on a, on a seven manifold uh, is sort of the same topically as taking a, a bundle on the seven manifold times S1.
And by standard kind of a Tia Singer theory, this spectral flow around such a loop is given by taking the index of a pseudo operator. In this case, it'll just be the, the Dirac operator coupled to the, the, the adjoint bundle, which is all these things are supposed to be tensors with the adjoint bundle um, of this, this, this bundle E. So to, to establish that we have a, a well-defined theory at this sort of elementary level, we want to prove that for all bundles over this product, this index is an even number. So I mean, that, there's no obvious reason why, just from definitions, it, it should be. But in fact, that is. What you find is, let me say this in words. And of course, you have a formula for this index, given by the, the T.S. Singer index theorem. But well, that's not obviously even an integer. I mean, that formula will involve denominators. So it's not clear just from the formula that you can even say that's an integer, let alone an even integer. So something has to be done. But if you, you can use the fact that you also have, can take the Dirac operator coupled to the fundamental representation, this bundle E. So I should say I haven't, I should say I'm always considering SU2 bundles in this. Um, in this discussion. So what you find is that this index is given by, this is 4 times the index of D in the fundamental representation. So that's, that's even, plus C2 of E squared. So what's, what's true just by basic algebraic topology because of this product structure this is always even. Well, so if you take this second churn class of E, is in H4 of this product, it has a term in H4 of Y and a term in H3 of Y multiplied with fundamental class of S1. And the square is given by twice the product of those two classes on Y. So this is something... Um, positive direction at least, that this, this, this orientation problem, which a priori might have been there, in fact, from slightly detailed considerations of the topology, actually, is not there. Uh, no, well, not, not that we're saying at this. We, we said we had an arbitrary, chose an arbitrary. So uh, uh, maybe later there would emerge as one, but at the moment we're just... It's up to an overall sign. There are also problems from reducibles, which also make further problems. So I'm, I'm going through this because it will be uh, relevant when we go on to discussing this compactness problem in the next 10 minutes. So what, what um, chance results would say a sequence of these um, connections on a fixed bundle would be that um, we, get a, we get a smooth limit outside a set of Hausdorff codimension 4, and the, 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 the codimension 4 component would be an associative, would satisfy some kind of weak form of the associative condition. I mean, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be a submanifold, but it would satisfy some generalization of this associative condition. So let's, well let's, for simplicity, suppose actually we are considering associative submanifolds. So we would like to understand when can we have a, uh, a nearby, supposing we have a, we have a bundle, we have a connection A0 on some bundle E0 over Y. We'd like to understand when can we have a connection, a solution of our equations, which is, roughly speaking, developing a, a bubble transverse to P? So that's what we'd like to consider, is something which outside a tubular neighborhood of uh, this P is essentially given by this connection here. But if we take a transversal slice, which is a four-dimensional thing, we should see something modeled on 
an instant on on R4. So this is something which, um, through work of well, the work of Andre Hades, more on the sort of different geometric background and on the analytical side of Wolpuski, we can um, understand quite well now. <coughs> so let me press on, just give you the, the answer. Not really have time, have time to explain how the construction comes out. First of all, supposing we have a map from, say, R3 to a, a hypercalar manifold, or a manifold with a quaternionic structure, then we can write down a, um, <coughs> a special equation an analogous to the Cauchy Riemann equations for such a map by saying I df dx1 plus j df dx2 plus k df dx3 is equal to zero. So this is what's called the Futter equation <coughs> for maps from R3 into a, a quaternionic manifold. And this is an elliptic equation. But supposing, more generally, we have a hypercalar manifold with an SO3 action, but the action of the, of the action of SO3 doesn't preserve i, j, and k. It rotates i, j, and k according to the standard action of SO3 um, Then we can um, do a generalization of this construction. If I let, if I let over a three manifold pi be the be the um, the frame bundle of the tangent bundle, <coughs> then I can take pi cross over SO three m. This is a bundle m. So I, this is a bundle over p with fiber m. But now there's a, if we consider sections of this bundle, then there's a footer equation for sections of this bundle, defined using the, also the connection on this, the, the, the connection in our frame bundle. So to say, although that was the, the ambiguity in the choice of frame in R3 is precisely made up for by the fact that you rotate the complex structures on, on uh, so there's, there's an analogous Futter equation, say, ds equals zero, the Futter equation. So in particular, we can do this when m is a moduli space of instantons on R4, and um, this SO3 action is... Um, Maybe, maybe strictly we should talk about spin three, but th th this, th this action comes from part of the rotation action of um, the rotations of R4 acting on the instanton moduli space. So M is going to be the instanton moduli space. Yeah, the fra so strictly I should say the ones which are centered at zero, we, we remove the translation invariance and we had to look at the framed instantons with the framing at infinity. I'm, I'm slightly, I want to get to the main point, I'm slightly uh, you're rushing ahead. Furthermore, if, if in fact we have an action of another group commuting with this SO3 action, then we can also couple this to an, 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 another bundle over our manifold. So the upshot is that associated to our background bundle E0 uh, and our instant on moduli space over P, we construct a, a bundle we construct a bundle M 
goes to P with fiber M such that a, a section of this bundle defines essentially an instant a, 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 a connection which is an instant on, on each of these transversal slices together with a way of gluing this to the bundle E naught on the boundary of this region. Saying it slightly simplified because I'm running out of time. And the, um, the, 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 the answer to our question of when we can find these bubbling solutions is that this section, we should find a section that satisfies the Futa equation, ds equals zero. So what, what happens is that generically, this, this, this is a connection which, this is, a, this, is a, this is an equation which depends upon P and the background connection A0. And generically, we expect that there, there are no solutions of this equation. But we expect in co-dimension one that we, we do, we encounter these, as I expect. In co-dimension one. So what that means is that if we think of varying in, so say, a one-parameter family of these G2 structures, then what will occur is that we'll have sometimes some finite number of solutions. And as we, as we vary, we expect that we will, these exceptional times when we have a solution of this equation, lose compactness. So we'll have some sort of picture like this. So uh, we do expect that this sort of the most naive answer to this problem, of counting, counting connections, these G2 instantons, is no, because if we count here, we'll get one number, and if we count here, we'll get a, def a different number, even when we've taken account of the signs and things, because we're definitely lo losing something at this um, point. If <coughs> and then there's an obvious way of um, trying to overcome that. So we want to count pairs because we want to associate it to our background connection A0 and our associative submanifold P. We also want to count those. So we want to count, we want to have some way of defining weights W of A0, P0. So what happens here is that we're not ex we're expecting that A naught just carries on deforming nicely and, and, and P naught. What, what the only special thing is that we pick up solutions of this Futa equation. So we want these to jump by plus or minus one when there's a solution of the Futa equation. So in this situation. We would, we would count this with some we would count this sort of point at infinity with some weight here on a different weight there that will precisely make up for the, the loss in the count of the, the actual connections. So I, I was, um, I ran out of time, but the, the, I, I was, what I was hoping to go on to describe was um, more precisely uh, the problems of doing this. And in particular, you see, then we have to worry, once we're starting in bringing in these associative submanifolds, we have to worry about what, what kind of singularities can appear in the associative submanifolds. And so there are some other kinds of singularities that you can derive and you can expect to occur in co-dimension one just for the submanifolds. And the, the, the counting procedure has got to be consistent with those. So I've, I've run out of time, so I don't have to tell you about, I don't have time to tell you about... Uh, more about that. But this is, this is um, and, and, and the, whether one can introduce these numbers is very much related to the more elementary problem of this problem, the spectral flow of whether you can define this orientation consistently. You see, roughly, we define this, we know how, to, we know how it should change as we vary the one-parameter family. The problem is to show this, this recipe is consistent as you go around. Right, so I'm afraid I've run out of time before being able to tell you in more detail about all these things. Questions? Compass dimension three, we 
and count curves, it's, but it's better to count and feel sheets. Is there a version of that for this or two? Well, that's what we want. I, I guess the answer is no, not that I know of, but certainly in, in the complex case, it's natural to mix up curves and bundles because they're all sheaves. And so if it's, there's a theory in which you can describe them in the same setting. Uh, because we don't have any algebraic geometry here, we have to do things more laboriously by differential geometry. But it's certainly in the same. I'm just asking, ideal sheaves correspond to physical terms responding to one bundle. Right. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I haven't thought about what the analog of a, a U1 theory would be. Can you say uh, uh, what role uh, co associative manifolds play in your fantasy 6 plus 1 plus 1 thing? Um. <coughs> That's an interesting question. It, it would be nice to bring them into this kind of framework. Um, the, the only way I know of doing that is um, more an analogous to the solutions of a monopole type equation on, on R3. Um, but that only works for non compact G2 manifolds. But one, one can write that, one can develop a theory in which that kind of links up with these. Uh, Co associatives with gauge theory. Do you expect a deformation invariant counting theory, just counting associatives on their own? No, no, I, 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 I don't. Because, well, if you do the analogous calculation, insofar as one can, to this orientation problem calculation in, in the framework of associatives, then one doesn't have the same control. So I, I, don't, I don't see even why at that level, really, one would get this. You don't think it's only counting problems with orientation? So, but not, 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 not really, no, not by itself, but when, that's right. When you, count the, when you count the associatives coupled to connections, it's different from just counting them by themselves. Um, do you have a candidate to fail G2 manifold by uh, for which you can apply this kind of invariant? Well, that'd be the kind of dream of what we'd like to do, but, but we're, we're um, <laughs> a long way. More explicit example. I think there are there are candidates there, there are there are exam yeah there are candidates where one could where we do we do have different descriptions on the same manifold, and it might be possible to imagine computing this. Invariant. But so we don't really know if we have an invariant at the moment. So, but but that, that would be the kind of thing one would like possibly to do.